Yeah, so, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, know me or the Open Knowledge Foundation, the Open Knowledge Foundation is, is a nonprofit. It was, it was founded nearly a decade ago. Um, it was initially community-based, so it was kind of volunteers, myself and others. Um, and our kind of, our, our, our aim is to empower people through, through, through open knowledge, through open information. And that involves obviously opening up material, making sure there is open data and open culture and open content out there. But also to empower people um, is ensuring that they also have the kind of tools and skills to utilize that, to make information used and useful. Because um, one thing to have there be, you know, open material, but it's another for it actually to make a difference in somebody's life. Um, to empower them, to enable them to make data decisions, to understand the world uh, more effectively. Um, and so quite a bit, I mean, quite a bit of our, our, our early work was about opening, making sure there was actually open information in the world. Um, because when we kind of started in about 2004, you know, open data as a term didn't really, didn't really wasn't in wide use. Um, you know, people were starting to kind of know about things like Wikipedia, uh, OpenStreetMap, actually, I, I lived in Cambridge, uh, UK, not Cambridge Mass at the time. And uh, the very summer, actually, just after we'd started, we were founded, actually, our ninth birthday was this, the start of this week. Um, <laughs> um, wonderful. Um, that, that very summer, I don't know, most of you here, you all know of OpenStreetMap, I imagine. I'm in a group that um, all knows of OpenStreetMap. And actually, that very summer, uh, uh, I met, I, I'd known Steve Coast, and he was, he, he, he was in Cambridge doing a, a job placement. Uh, kind of a summer job, and that's when he had the, kind of knocked up the first version of OpenStreetMap. Uh, had this incredibly battered laptop uh, that that was really with this kind of GPS, very clunky at the time. I mean, it was like a whole backpack full of stuff that he would wander around with. Um, so at that point, though, that was a very kind of novel, you know, the uh, term open data. I was actually looking back at the first events we ever ran in 2005, and we kind of talked about open data a bit. We talked about civic information. We talked about uh, you know, uh, open culture, open information, uh, free information, quite a lot. Um, and so it's been it's been an incredible journey to to today. Uh, when I see you know not only not only groups like this, but also uh, increasingly startups, um, you know, governments, uh, you know, fifty year old policymakers going on about open data um, and the power of transparency. I think we do have we do have an interesting um, question about the actual empowerment side of this. I think that's the real challenge um, that we have. I think it's quite easy to be a bit glib about technology and think that somehow magically, uh, you know, because we know something, change happens. And the truth, unfortunately, of history is that that frequently is not the case. <laughs> There's a lot of things that people know that don't lead to the world getting better or, 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 or better decisions being, make, being made. Um, and I think particularly Ironically, some of the things that we're most interested in, which is around government and governance, are actually the hardest problems for information on its own to make a difference. Um, because the, the large, you know, the challenges of decision making involve quite a lot of complexity around like coordination. You know, some person wants to build a strip mall in my neighborhood, I alone on my own can't make a difference. And, you know, we confront every day the fundamental irrationality of democracy, which is why does anyone vote? makes no sense to vote because you're going to make almost no difference versus everybody else. Why, why would you ever go and vote? Um, logically, right? Because you, you know, you're, 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 you know, there's almost no election that's been divided, decided by one vote, right? So logically you staying home should make no difference, you know, and you could just instead mow the lawn or have a beer or do whatever. Now, of course, logic, if you apply that logically, everyone would stop voting and then you would make a big difference. Um, but it's but it's a fundamental problem that issue essentially the free rider problem the issue of coordination are really really deep problems that you know have plagued humanity throughout history and plague us very fundamentally today. I mean, it's glib to say, but like the fundamental challenge we have is you know, climate change. We went over 400 parts per million uh, kind of last week kind of officially, and that is the biggest coordination problem that we face as as a society and as a world. Um, and information may be one part of that but there's a hell of a lot of tough politics and other stuff as well. Um, and so one point of that I say is that we've done a lot of open data, but we also believe you know, the empowerment isn't just through the fact that you know, what your, you know how your party voted, um, but it's also, also from having access to your, your culture, having access to the thoughts and philosophies and great novels and great works of art that we've produced. 
And so we also do a whole bunch of work. And so I should make a shout out here actually to one project from our portfolio that you wouldn't associate with uh, CCAN, you know, our WordPress for data, which is the public domain review, which if I can make a pit, you know, make a plug for it, is, you know, if you're ever looking for some lunchtime meeting, the beautiful material that's all open, uh, check out the public domain review, uh, which is basically a magazine of, of material from the public domain. Um, and which is on our, on our logic of going back use and use for, there's been a whole bunch of initiatives. One of the things we identify is a whole bunch of initiatives that opened up great cultural material. I mean, archive.org, probably a bunch of you know of Bruce DeCarlo's work at archive.org. It's just amazing what they've done. But it, it, if, I mean, it's probably, I don't think you'll be offended me saying it's like probably the worst piece of UI design I've, I've, I've yet seen if you've ever been there. I think because they just don't pay, like their job is to archive all this stuff, like a library. They don't care about you know, the user experience there so much. Uh, of, of at least the archive.org site. And so part of our logic of, of, of the public domain review was an example, we weren't opening up information at all. We were simply saying, hey, no one cares about, the, no one's gonna care about the public domain. No one's gonna care about the fact actually that the public domain keeps being like stolen from basically by copyright extension because no one really sees the amazing stuff that's in it. Um, and so the logic of the public domain review is as a project from us actually is exemplifying this example of making it used and useful, presenting curated great material from the public domain. Um, and also another aspect of the OKF, which is it was done by basically started by a volunteer who just came along, uh, an artist based in Berlin, who said uh, he actually loved, you know, he loved uh, doing cut-ups and collage, and was like, okay, I'm going to start to do cut-up and collage. I use a lot of public domain material. Why don't I start curating it? Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's it's now it's now just past 10,000 readers, uh, you know, regular subscribers, and uh, he just raised wonderfully to support him to go on doing it. This guy, twenty thousand dollars. So you know. Go and subscribe to the public domain review, uh, and it exemplifies this. That also, that it's not just about data. You know, it's very important. It's not, you know, empowering people isn't just through them knowing exactly how their government's voted and maybe taking a better decision. It's also about um, us as citizens, us as being, you know, full human beings. I think. Um, so maybe the one other thing to touch on, because not everyone is about, is kind of work we've done. So opening up, I mentioned we did a lot of work saying the open definition. What is open data? was written in 2005 and it's essentially, I wouldn't say stolen, borrowed from the open source definition. And of course the work of the free and open source software community has inspired so much of, of this. I mean, in some, some ways we have a phrase or ideas are cheap, implementation is costly. Um, and, and normally ideas are pretty, so the, all, most of the ideas that we've ever kind of come up with, I think even in this group, in this kind of the community around open data and open information is kind of there, um, prior to that in, in the free and open source movement and probably before that in academia. Um, and you can, we can learn a lot as well about, about things they did. And so that brings you, so one thing was the open definition, which says what open data is, uh, freedom to use, reuse, and redistribute. Obviously a bunch of bugging and trying to persuade governments to open up information. But it also led us into the other point, which is for us, um, one, one big debate maybe where the free and open source software kind of side of things is you know, why is that open source why don't we just have free software and one is the kind of free software commitment as a kind of principle to openness and the open source side which is i think is much more utilitarian um which is like you know i open source stuff if it's useful to me because it's you know maybe people contribute and fix my libraries it's the way that people many companies many of them that you'll know here in silicon valley happily open source libraries but don't open source their core products um, because their libraries they benefit from, but open source and their core product might be detrimental to them. And I think, you know, there are several things from that. One is a really important point, which is that generally principles on their own aren't that actually, unfortunately, tend to not, just saying, hey, everything should be open morally <laughs> doesn't always cut it, um, really. Uh, at the same time, I think it's really important that you don't always just get completely caught up in the utilitarian side of it because there are real reasons, I think even more powerfully than for software, why there's important sets of information that really should kind of, not, maybe not say morally, but on a principle basis be open and available. Um, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether we'll get more startups or more businesses or more economic growth, whether you know, I know where my tax dollars go or I know, you know, how my, my representatives vote it. That isn't, you know, if in fact there would be less start, you know, if in fact there'd be more startups by selling this off to the highest, you know, three bidders and then like using it to, you know, to ring out the most number of new jobs and dollars, that's not, that still wouldn't, I think, be a good thing. 
Um, but at the same time, in this debate, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of utilitarian, correctly kind of argument for this. Um, and thing that that brings me to, and it's going to segue uh, into the discussion around CCAN is, if you want open to win, if you want open to win, I think in some of these areas, um, you've got to make it you've got to make it um, more attractive for the average person who doesn't really care probably about open to use it. Um, and I think this is particularly true. I, I think sometimes beyond the basic set of us persuading governments, for governments we have a really strong argument why they should make, you know, the taxpayers already pay for it. I mean, of course, that's not, it's not always totally true because the whole argument is by selling the money, they reduce your tax payments. But, you know, the, the basic logic that a lot of the upfront cost is already being paid for by all of this, of all of the stuff. You know, when you go to get the list of companies who are incorporated or you get the list or you look at the, the, your, your uh, town's finance documents, you, you know, there's been a bunch of bureaucrats who've been paid to get that stuff together and manage it and so on. Um, if we're trying to persuade others and we're trying to develop a real ecosystem of open information, we need it to be in people's interest to use open and to give back to open. And one of the logics, again, of that of free and open source software, I think, was building tooling and infrastructure that made it super easy to get, to get stuff if you like code, onto your machine and use it. Um, I know I'm getting a little bit geeky for the people out there maybe, but um, most people, at least in this room, are coders, and they use probably, I don't know, Python or Ruby or JavaScript. And all of these systems have these tools that you almost take for granted, like for dependency management and saying, when you install this project, you install all this other stuff, and it's just magically there. And that, you know, that really reduces your cost. And it also has another effect, which is, if that code isn't open, it's pretty hard for it to get into a registry where you can automatically download it, right? So there's a huge bias to open libraries and tools in those systems. In fact, in Python, nothing gets onto, I think, the Python package index if it isn't actually open source. At least I've never found anything. Similarly, like Node, you know, NPM or Ruby Gems, all of these things like this, Debian. And one of our challenges, I think, at the moment is the cost of usage of, of data generally is quite high. And it's such that the licensing issue is, if I can get good, high-quality data that's already cleaned up, and it's, I'm going to have to pay for it, I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to pay for it because if I'm a company, it's just, it's just lower cost of ownership, as it were, for the whole deal. And the thing was, that was probably true for code once. You know, if, I wanted, if I wanted a PDF uh, reader or writer that worked, you know, I probably paid for it. You know, if I wanted this or that or other tool, I paid for it because it's the case. Over time, A, there's been more of those systems, but also we've built, we've built tooling around particularly around componentization that makes open really attractive at the kind of library level, you know, the kind of level of these libraries. And we need to do that with data. And so in fact, that was the inspiration for CCAN. Uh, for the geeks out there, uh, CCAN was kind of a reference to CPAN. Perl has really taken a dive uh, in the last uh, decade. So most people don't, don't use Perl anymore. Uh, but Perl had something called the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network, which was this reg the registry, like it was, the Python cheese shop, it was the equivalent of Deb the Debian package index. It was, it was this place you went and got Perl stuff. Um, and so CCAN was the Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network with a reference to this, which was when we started the OKF, we said, okay, you need to know what open is, and that's the open definition. So let's go do that. We need to tell people about what open is, and we need to start building infrastructure that makes open super attractive for people to use it. Because um, even if we're kind of true believers, of, of the value and the fact it's going to empower people, we have to attract a whole bunch of people who just don't, don't really care that much about that. They just want to use data for whatever purpose they're doing it. And so CCAN was saying, hey, let's build this registry. Um, let's build a system and let's build tooling around it that will automate, you know, like these building blocks. So I don't know, like just think of a stupid thing you might want to do, which is, I don't know, compare gasoline prices between San Francisco and San Jose uh, or over, or you want to combine it over time, you're like, okay, maybe someone's get, getting a time series of data in San Jose and someone in San Francisco. It wouldn't be magic if you kind of had, you know, DPM, Data Package Manager install, you know, San Jose gasoline, San, you know, San Francisco. And even better, what happens if you want to deflate those data over time? You want to say, remember that, you know, the price index goes up, the cost of living increases. Um, so what happens if I want to compare gasoline prices Today, compared to 10 years ago, I can't just look at the numbers. I need to look at inflation. And you, know, you start getting all of this stuff, um, and, you know, and you have it together. And um, So the dream of CCAN was that. CCAN itself has morphed 
uh, into what I would call WordPress for data. It's turned into a data management, data publishing system. Um, one of the most widely used, the, certainly the most widely used open source system um, now uh, for publishing data from government and from others. We're seeing uh, just, just, just two days ago, a guy who I met who I, I, I'd never known said, we're using it to, to pull together uh, millions of records. We're using it to kind of manage and publish millions of inf uh, records of kind of pupil information in India about school performance um, in an NGO. Um, so I think it's going to, you know, like WordPress, like CMSs, DMSs, data management systems, are going to be, have ubiquitous usage. Um, but I still say, while CCAN has kind of altered somewhat and become this WordPress for data, this dream of how we do scalable stuff for open to make it super easy to share and combine data sets and componentize. Um, it's something that I still am really, really interested in. And it's why I'm really interested in small data and not big data. Um, it's why, don't get me wrong, I think often the things we want to get, but we want to maybe get is that it involves quite a lot of data, but just as like, no one really goes on about, I've got big code. Aren't you envious of the big code I have? No, no one thinks that. People think it's better to have small bits that you combine and the elegance comes from building complex, you know, super complex systems. Your operating system is, the operating system that runs these computers is probably the most complex artifact mankind has ever produced. But the way that we've built it, the way that ultimately successful way to build it has been built to combine smaller components that people work on into in a, a bigger whole, right? Um, and in general, these smaller component systems have beaten out the monolithic ones without naming any names here. Um, you know, and so I think my point is not that we don't want to have analyzed big amounts of information, but we do that by building small components that we combine as needed um, to do what we want. Um, and I think particularly for a community where I think the power of open is in distribution and collaboration, that's essential. Um, I mean, it's also true, of course, that with the acceleration, what is, what is big data today will be small data tomorrow. Um, but I do think that something, there is also something really special. Why, why, did, you know, why, why have all these organizations come into existence right now isn't coincidental. You know, the OKF, when it was founded in 2004, the Open Knowledge Foundation, it wasn't a total coincidence in that data is about an order of magnitude bigger than code. It's so like the breakthrough in code was like the 80s and 90s. And it isn't, you know, I'm getting very kind of... Uh, I don't know, the now school, the structuralist, the structuralist kind of historian here on this, right? Because I think there are fundamental economic reasons or, or reasons this happens. Um, and one of that is that um, in the 80s and 90s, suddenly you could share bits around cheap enough on the internet that people could share code um, in, in, in numbers that weren't just kind of geeks at MIT. Um, I mean, some of that stuff had got done already, but that was a real breakthrough. Um, and, and data is about order magnitude bigger. So if in 1995 I said, you know, I'd even said, you know, average time series data sets or, you know, my government spending, it would have been super, super difficult to do. Um, I mean, the number I go for is 1994, a terabyte of storage cost you about $450,000, right? And today we all know it's about $50 to $100. And that's a really genuine difference for data that I think means that it was really around the 2000s to 2010 that we could talk about distributed collaborative communities doing stuff with data that were, you know, average citizens or average geeks or whatever. Um, and it's why, again, small data, I think this is the era of small data in that sense, because suddenly small data is big enough to be really meaningful. I can have the whole of the currently, the last three years of UK government spending at a transactional level on my laptop. And I can load it into Postgres and do stuff on it in about, it loads in about two minutes, you know, five gigabytes of data, which it is at the moment, of CSV, loads in about two minutes uh, on my SSD, you know, and that's, that's a real difference too, SSD hard drives. But it's a real transformational point. And I think the real excitement is not big companies with big Hadoop clusters doing new stuff. It's really what you can do, um, what maybe, a, you know, a single, a single, you know, uh, data geek within the government can do or with, with two or three of his friends. I mean, it's true, obviously, we can also, some of this stuff gets commoditized, but I think that's what's really exciting. And what's exciting we have not cracked yet is how do we build the kind of, the tools we have for collaboration and, and, and distributed uh, kind of management of data um, between us. That, that, that is still, uh, and I'm still searching, I know uh, one of your previous fellows, Max Ogden, I mean, talking a lot, you know, how do you do distributed version control for data? 
because that's that's the magic right of kind of git and pull requests and you know sharing um, which is still super difficult and which is I think another reason why you see very centralized data projects at the moment I mean I think that's another thing by the way I'm, 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 I'm rambling somewhat here but another odd thing to remark on is that okay it's fine um, I think another odd thing to remark on, which is, why has the internet, why has the web seen such centralization over the last decades? I mean, you, I don't know, you guys, it's, uh, uh, you know, you guys probably are all now younger than me. Um, but when, when I went on the web, you know, I looked for information. I went to a lot of different places. I mean, I still do to some extent, but like now pretty much everyone's number one top hit is like Wikipedia, and you go to Wikipedia, and you know, I don't know these estimates, but a lot of people spend you know, some large percentage of their web time on about five sites. Um, and that, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I think there's, and it's similar, you've seen it in data in some sense. Um, you know, the, the, the players who are doing stuff with a lot of data is often been quite large centralized projects. In a way that isn't the same with code in quite the same way, right? I mean, it, it, there was a period when you did have that, and like most code projects were super, in some ways, centralized. And in a way, we've seen that distribute um, into smaller components that integrate in some way. And I do think that that, 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 rep, you know, that, that again, going back, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if it's crystal ball, but it's something that is going to change because it's represented one thing, which was that it was really costly. Capital requirements were high. Um, it also represents an interesting thing, which is a monopoly of network structures. So back in the early telephone era, you know, there was AT&T. That, you know, network, a lot of things on the internet turn out to be network goods. Even GitHub. GitHub is very interesting and kind of like, kind of somewhat scary setup in a way because before I collaborated on code and I might collaborate with people, but I wasn't tied into a social network around it. You know, I, well, I didn't care like who was following me or that I was using exactly the same platform as them. You know, as long as I was using the same tool or protocol, I was using Subversion. I didn't really care where you were hosted, but now I kind of do. You know, it's just like, I care whether I'm on Twitter. I can't go somewhere else and participate in that network. It was like once upon a time, like anyone comes to the web, set up their blog, and you'd go there. But now, suddenly, like you blog on the same platform, and you know you retweet. You know, it's like you re. You know, you you have to be on the same platform because that's how they can like reblog you easily and like you know follow you easily and you know so on. And we've kind of gone into these slightly walled gardens and these these net networks, which are very sticky. Over the last decade, quite rapidly. And it is an interesting phenomenon to ask, which is that the net, which everyone kind of thinks of as, wow, it's this like place, anyone, anyone can do stuff, has been gradually centralized quite substantially over the last decade. And I think this does relate, as I said, so coming back to data, I think we've had similar stuff like that. Google is probably the, probably maybe the largest host of data. I don't know, maybe the NSA has more. We never know, right? Um, um, we never know those things until it's too late. Um, but, but, you know, someone like, you know, Google is, is kind of incredible. You know, it just would be infeasible at the moment to build a distributed search engine, just as it might have been, like, it would have been kind of maybe inconceivable in 1975 that, you know, Linux would work in the way that it did. And I think at the moment it's pretty difficult if you went, you know, people have tried distributed search, right, and it's kind of just failed. I don't know if you even know that Wikia had a go at it about four or five years ago. You know, what, how, would you, how would you, you know, search engine, it is the fundamental general purpose technology of the information age, search. You know, if you're not in Google or you're not in one of the search engines, you're, you just don't exist in that realm, basically, in some way, right, in the world now. You know, if you can't find me, if you can't find me on the first page, you probably don't exist. And that's like a really, really, it's a really fundamental power as well, far beyond just an economic power, a cultural power. Um, but it's also, it's also a really significant technology and tool. And at the present, it's kind of, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it represents just economics in some sense. That is centralized. Because building a distributed system to do that around the data, all the integration, think of all the extraction of addresses, of telephone numbers. Think how good Google has got or other things like that, that kind of stuff. The amount of learning and machine learning that's just going on behind that. Um, is incredible. And I think the question I would have at the moment, and I, I'm hopeful about, is that we've gone through a big period of centralization, which represents, in some sense, the often early stages, so we need a lot of capital. And we're at the beginning of a period of decentralization and of small data and of the ability to build systems that really make open, small, and decentralized really attractive. And why does that all relate back to open data? Because in, that, in, a, in a world, something like Google, it doesn't really matter 
like bluntly to Google, it did not matter whether GTF S was open or not. And the early stuff, they built the standard, but they could go and do negotiations with individual cities and they could get the data and they could integrate. In fact, as in last year, I was in Sao Paulo and people from OpenStreetMap were spitting blood because Sao Paulo had just done some deal to give their route maps and their timetables to Google, but not to anybody else, right? So, G you know, frankly, to someone like Google, they don't really care whether GTFS is, is open that much. But anyone building an app who isn't them cares a hell of a lot. And don't get me wrong, you know, I think Google have got their heart often in a good place, but fundamentally they don't care that much because they're big enough, they can deal with it, they can do the deals, they can integrate the messy data. But for if, if you really care about open data, having a decentralized, powerful ecosystem and having the infrastructure that really makes open work well in that, that makes the fact that, that the cost of getting data is really low, so then the fact that it's open really matters. The fact that the cost of getting data, making a patch and giving back. So, you know, one of the experiments I've really been playing with, uh, so this kind of leads in, is to say, just hoist data sets on Git, in Git and on GitHub, uh, whatever. Because uh, there was huge amounts of debate about how you do this, like how you do distributed version control for data. And you can read papers, if you like, on this stuff. But I really, like at the moment, I really think the best thing is to abuse tools not built for data. Because you know, the fundamental problem, right, of like putting stuff in a text-oriented diffing system like, uh, like Git is that, you know, for example, um, let's just think of something, I don't know, removing dollar signs, which is kind of like from a column, you know, in 100,000 line CSV is 100,000 line diff. Um, or, you know, rearranging columns, like moving one column across changes your entire file. So it's a really kind of, in a way, inappropriate tool, but it's a really, really great tool, right? It's like, it's a, you know, basically diff systems for line-oriented data are just super, super sophisticated and great. And the merge algorithms around them are really great. So one of the things, like, if you go to github.com slash datasets, um, and I started getting pull requests. You know, we started getting pull requests from people. I think it's a, it's a great, it's the beginning of a model that would really work um, like that, you know? Um, this kind of, you know, pull request for data. You know, what is, what is it that makes that work? And what makes it work distributed? Because a lot of the models at the moment are like, why don't we build Wikipedia for data? Why don't we all build a central place? Everyone will come there and we'll build some kind of stuff around it. And that isn't the future, I don't think. The future is not Wikipedia for data. It's like Debian for data. It's kind of distributed for data. And so, anyway, so I think that's one really interesting thing at the moment, which is, and again, it comes back to scale. Suddenly, storing a 100,000 line CSV in, in, in Git repository on GitHub is actually not, not a big deal, um, actually. You know, I think even, a, you know, probably could get away with like up to almost a million lines. I mean, you might be starting to have trouble on your, your account levels, but you know, General, it actually the performance is not that bad. I mean, a million lines I would be pushing it, but certainly we've got it up to like a hundred thousand without a problem. I think that's a really, really attractive model. Use these tools that we've got that are really good, and really make that. Because the thing is, how often, how often do you get pull requests or patch during your data? It's one of the frustrating things on all the data portals I've seen that have been built. Is the mechanisms for giving feedback? I mean, they all have them. You can leave a comment at the bottom of the page. You know, they, they all have these systems. And having had actually been involved in having built, they just don't, they don't work. They just don't work very well. Um, and, you know, I think that kind of pull request patch system for it would just be, would be amazing. Anyway, um, so kind of to, 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 to sum up, I think the arc of it is we want to empower people through open information. To do that, we need open information. We need tools and we need skills. We need the tools for people to be able to use it. We need them to have the skills and know-how. So that's me. one other plug, a project we have, School of Data. Okay, help teach people, particularly in civil society organizations and the media, how to use data, how to get data savvy. So we need those things. And a fundamental part for the more kind of techie geek audience is we need to make tools that make open data attractive. For the people who don't care philosophically one way or the other, we have to make it super attractive to use open data. We have to reduce those costs. And I would say the, the great thing about this is infrastructure that works for open data works for data too. So anyone interested in just data generally is interested, but they differentially benefit open data. If we, mean it, if we make it as a way that it's two seconds to get data onto your machine into Excel or into R or whatever it is, and it's like 30 seconds to fix a large patch back, that benefits all data systems, but it benefits open data and much more. 
And so I think that's a key aspect at the moment of, of, of work that we should be doing is how do we build those 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 infrastructure and those infrastructure make those infrastructures also I think it's essential that it be open. Um, yeah. And so that's it. I think that's that's the, the sum up from me. I haven't said anything about CCAN yet, but you're gonna ask questions. Yeah. Hello. It doesn't sound like it actually works. Um, I'm interested in the story of getting the government to use CCAN and leave a paid model for an open source free model. So I, mean, I think, I think um, yeah, I mean, I think one was we were very fortunate in some sense in the UK. We, we were lucky in that we'd built CCAN for our own use and it existed and was functioning and working. Um, and I think also I just can kind of like to say the original the original users so two big users have obviously been data.gov.uk and data.gov now in the US but there's also been you know the Brazilian government you know it's used in Argentina it's used in like several dozen over a dozen countries now I think certainly in the UK as well I think it was a really um, bold thing I don't know I don't know if they have the distinction um, and they didn't get as much. I mean, Gov. There's also this Gov UK project now in the UK, which has been doing great work. But I think they had the, you know, they let us. They they took a bet on an open source project in the early stage, and they like you know really worked open source. And when that happened, like four years ago, governments didn't do that as much as they do now. Uh, <laughs> I think we were one of the first kind of. They both used Drupal and CCAN. It was like one of the first I think UK government kind of in the heart of government open source projects. And I think they kind of. Um, so I think that was that was a great thing. I think the other point is that governments are super aware now that open source, um, particularly particularly in tools that are kind of platforms they're going to integrate a lot with. And I think, you know, your data portal is really like that. Um, it's like a content management system. Um, you know, it, 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 it's going to be integrated and customized in a bunch of ways. Open source really op offers, you know, ultimately, a you know, it offers control. It offers, you know, zero lock-in. And it off, you know, offers lower total cost of ownership. Um, and I think it offers that, and it offers flexibility. And I think those things um, have been, I think the weakness um, that we've had, I mean, the problem often we've had actually is more interest, the challenge of being an open source project, and one obviously that we don't just run, but many other people contribute to, the challenge you have is, you know, you don't have a sales staff in the same way. You don't go out and like pitch to people. You don't have the, you know, most governments, the big challenge is, you know, there's procurement, there's all this stuff. And so I think, the big, the big, the big win has also been find that champion, find that person in government who understands the, you know, why open source is valuable to them, why it means flexibility, why it means control for them, why it means lower cost of ownership going forward, um, and, and you know, f you need to find that person um, because your other your other challenge is otherwise you know the procurement process is such that you know I don't know someone has to go through it and have the resource to put together the bid documents all that stuff. Um, so I know so it's a great question um, and I think the big thing was just having something which was which was good and also having some you know having being fortunate to see some civil servants who were far seeing uh, or you know uh, and and also to to so far to have had also investment from them in improving the product and the other is fine I think also having a product that people really do need to customize I think it really makes open source that's why I think I think open source in this area will you know, I'm not a fanatic. I think you know, there's some areas, the closed source products are fantastic, uh, but I think the areas, particularly like CMS, why do people use open source CMS so much? They want to customize it, they want to integrate it, they want to extend it. That's where open source has really, really big value if you're a user. Um, I mean, I think the other thing, sorry, just sorry, last, I, I mean, the last point right now is if you're trying to talk to a government right now is to say, well, you know, data.gov UK, data.gov using it, cities around, you know, the cities in the US, South America, UK, you know, Germany, whatever, are using this. This is, this is a proven tool. It's got buy-in. It's got big people behind it. Because I think the big worry about open source is like, you know, is it, is it here today, gone tomorrow? This is there. It's going to be there. It's got major investment from, from, from people using it um, and from multiple stakeholders. And it's got professional support from various organizations. That's a big deal. It means that, you know, and that's a tip I'd say because I really believe in open source, but you've really got to make that point, particularly in a business case, you know, that, that there are going to be people there to support it, that there's going to be buy-in and so on.
Yeah, so you, you talked about um, open data being useful in these uh, kind of uh, policy analysis situations. You talk about uh, educating people that are in civil service um, and people in the media. But you also, at the beginning of your talk, talked a lot about the, um, the challenge being getting um, uh, people that don't have a philosophical interest in, in open data, uh, people that just practically want to use it to help them make decisions. Um, sort of uh, from a like consumer choice or firm decision, at a firm decision level, how are you seeing open data helping businesses, helping consumers uh, make choices, uh, better choices? Well, I think, I mean, I think one is that you are seeing it kind of the use of it, and I sort of mentioned GTFS earlier, but you know, the fact is open transport data is now being integrated by the kind of services that people do see every day. Um, I think you're seeing it, um, you're also seeing it even, you know, users of Foursquare, you now use open data kind of every day um, and have a better experience because of that. Um, I think, so I think you are, you are seeing that. I mean, I think there's a challenge also about open data for broader people. Like, you know, when I talk to my mom, you know, the classic thing, which is that, you know, people, there are, there are some things that we kind of think of, like, I think we kind of sometimes get Wikipedia envy. It's kind of like everyone knows Wikipedia because it's a destination. And the irony about open data is it's going to be kind of invisible. It's kind of like, and the number of people you know, you, you know, you guys are all geeks. You've all heard of OpenStreetMap, but when I, well, relatively, whereas when you talk to most, when you talk to most people, they've heard of Wikipedia now, but they've not heard of OpenStreetMap, and they probably never will, because it's kind of that copyright symbol at the bottom of the page. Even though, in some ways, it's 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 actually, in some ways, a more a more amazing project. What's happened out of OpenStreetMap than Wikipedia in in many senses. Um, so I think I, I mean I think other ones I've you know I've now seen loads of uses of you know, open data, not just to build apps, but apps, are, you know, apps have been used. I've seen it used to take, do analysis from you know, drug prescription, you know, drug, drug usage within the health service to other areas where it saved money. Um, I still think that going back to a point, um, what's the difference between open data and closed data? Because you know, closed data exists before. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't like the government didn't have some of this data internally to make decisions with or whatever. I think there's still the point is also going back to the previous discussion, open data really proves itself. I know it sounds a bit corny, but at scale, it's when you're integrating it with other data sets and it's kind of the rapidity. It's like, you know, before, before open source was so popular, there was closed source, but it's the rate of innovation and the rate of insight and the rate at which you can put stuff together. And the, the challenge still a little bit at the moment is there's a lot of, is a, there's a very kind of moth-eaten tapestry of open data. You know, you might get you might get this data set, and then this other data set you need essentially to integrate it with is just, oh, it's not available. Um, and so I think that has been challenging. And I, to give a concrete example, we're really interested in, in like we have a project open spending uh, with a bunch of other people, which is kind of an open street map for money. We want to map the money, you know, worldwide, get a big pool, or you know, get get a uh, you know the biggest consolidated pool of of finance information, see that being used. Classic thing, okay, I'm a, I'm a citizen. Um, you know, where can I see the money that was associated with this contract? Or, you know, where's the contract associated with collecting my rubbish? Um, or, you know, what, just tell me a basic question, like which companies actually receive the money? And it's actually, those questions start to be really difficult because like, well, maybe, you know, if you're lucky to even have the detail on what detailed spending, it doesn't have the company information or identifier in it, or it's not linked with contracts. So, you know, there's this piece of spending, but you have no idea what contract it relates to. So there's kind of like questions quite quickly that are very basic, you know, that my mother would ask me, okay, oh, I'm really great. This is really great. But, you know, how much they spend, you know, why are there all those holes in the, you know, in the, in the, in the tarmac, you know, on the road after the winter, you know, and, you know, why, why is the area next door better? And like, tell me how much they're spending on it. Uh, you know, you do all this work on this project and I'm like, oh, I'm going to say it's really complicated. And, you know, and it doesn't, you know, that, that's part of the challenge, which is people don't really care about the complexity. They want to see the results. And at the moment, sometimes we're confronted by that frustration that we have parts of this puzzle. Um, so you talked a little bit about reducing the friction to actually publishing data sets. Can you talk a little bit about um, kind of how CCAN has evolved to address that need and sort of what needs to happen for that to get easier? Yeah, I mean, so one thing, so the WordPress for data, the kind of why CCAN has evolved, I mean, the way it is is because obviously if you can't make it super easy for people to publish data, that's, that's, an, that, that's a major obstacle. 
And I think one thing is at the moment, so the CCAN 2.0, which just came out and which data.gov and the, the you know, uh, US government are now using, one is it has really strong integration. It kind of st some of these things start out as kind of catalogs. Um, and it, it has both a kind of catalog component, which makes it easy to kind of list what you've got, um, but also now very strong ability to store and like store the data, query it, all that stuff. And that's existed in it now for about a year and a half, but the latest version is really upgraded that. And I think that's, so that's a big item. Um, I still think the other thing at the moment is making it, um, I still think one of the challenges at the moment as well goes back to this, goes back to this question of, of, of small data and structured data and of feedback is that a lot of the data I see in these systems is kind of poor, a little bit poor quality. <laughs> uh, you know, so one of the challenges as well at the moment I would really like to see in which CCAN has support for but could be way better is the kind of the feedback loops. How do you say there's something wrong with this? How do you say, here, I've, I've fixed up your data set. You know, you've come to the government site, but actually, here's this data set. And so, so CCAN, for example, has ability to do that, say, hey, here's this related data set. The problem, obviously, with working with government is you always got super complex, that's overly complex workflows about, you know, God, if we let people post information, we'll end up with kind of, and it's not properly moderated, you know, there'll be stuff about porn or whatever it is. So some of those things have been held back a bit by that. Um, but I think we're getting there in terms, so CCAN basically, I think, massively kind of reduces the cost of publishing up data, makes it, you know, it, it's kind of very fast to do, but also means we can start kind of putting, not only kind of encouraging and forcing people to structure data in a way that will make it much easier to consume. So in a sense, We've made it cheaper to kind of publish because now you can take your random Excel and get it up online really quickly. But the next step is make sure that random Excel isn't so random. You know, it doesn't have 10 blank lines at the top and all the actual data you want is on page 10 um, and so on. That, I think, is the next stage that's really, that's really interesting. And to end something, I think, about CCAN there is it is built as a really rich API from the beginning. Everything that you could do in the web interface, you could kind of automate through the API. So I think a lot of that stuff does not have to be in CCAN. You could build a great little app that was like, I go through CCAN and I check, you know, which Excel files have blank lines at the top of them and then write that information back into the, the, the system or correct the data. So I think the other thing about it is it's really an ecosystem thing as well, which is you can really easily build plugins and API extensions that would do that. Um, and that's been a design principle of CCAN from the start to really make that powerful and easy to do. Um, so one of the, one of the really compelling parts of your talk was about the, uh, consolidation piece. And there's a question, a strategy question that we have here at Code for America when we talk about, um, promoting, developing, uh, data standards, uh, for government data. And one of the big selling points to get cities compliant with a spec is around a large data retailer integrating that data. So for instance, with restaurant inspections, it's uh, Yelp or with, um, or with uh, code enforcement violations, it might be Trulia. And so what role would you like to see a CFA or a OK play in either catering to that consolidation or what can we do to, to make sure that those standards remain as open as possible? That's a great, a great question. I, I think I and mean, I think one is obviously uh, Code for America or the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, can act as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of third, a kind of neutral third party in that sense. I um, mean, one thing actually I want to emphasize is one of the things we're developing with CCAN is obviously we've, we've played a big role in developing it. Um, we still do quite a lot of work, but we, we also see that it's kind of moving. We really want to move it in the WordPress.org direction where, you know, like, data.gov, data.gov UK, our stakeholders, they've got their own, they've actually got their own agendas, they're doing their own development, um, they have their actually, you know, uh, there are, you know, they're now far more developers out there than at the Open Knowledge Foundation. And I think that's, so why I mention that is I think in being a, in a, being a trusted third party, um, I think that's essential. And one of the challenges of that is I think you want to push things in, in a direction, but obviously also act, you know, reasonably neutrally. Um, and so one of the things we would really, you know, we really encourage even around CCAN is trying to build, you know, we'd be involved in the W3C, but building standards, while we will do them in CCAN, um, that there are also standards that other, other vendors and others can use. Um, and that's also why we're super strong at the moment, I'm kind of saying this, is in, in kind of taking CCAN.org as being something we kind of put in a steering, you know, a steering committee and things like that. And I think that's another tip is saying, it's great, I think one point you've made is it's really important to have a vendor who's going to consume it.
it might also be important to say it's not just always one vendor. I mean, it's, sometimes it's, it's the case. It's only it only needs to be one. And maybe they don't they don't have a dog in the fight about what's going on. But particularly, for example, about APIs, and I'd say it about Seek and Chew, if everyone builds their apps against this particular provider's APIs, you know what what hap you know what happens to anyone else who wants to? You know, what happens if another jurisdiction wants to? You know, deploy something different. You know, wouldn't it be great if the apps worked in different places and so on? So I think that that's another thing um, I'd say for CFAs. I think it's really important to bring those people to the table. I think it's really important to try and say, you know, make sure it, it, that that where it's appropriate, that it's multiple people and it's not it's not just what, necessarily one system specific. Yeah. Right. I think some of that is just, it is a principle if you're trying to bring people, it's like, you know, the W3C, as a standards organization, you have some principles which are the basis in which everyone comes to the table. And, you know, one of that could be open data, you know, uh, you know, perhaps at least one, you know, classically, I think W3C one is like at least two implementers, you know, kind of thing. Um, yeah, no, I, no I, 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 think, I think that's really important. Uh, and you, you, you kind of talked a little bit about the dichotomy between um, open source and free software and one having a more pragmatic view and one having a, a moral component. And I think there's a similar divide in the open data world. Um, as an example, OpenStreetMap last year relicensed to the open database license. And there were a lot of partisans on either side, some saying, oh, it should have been public domain, and some saying, no, the share alike clause is very important. I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. Well, I think I had many debates on the main list over years uh, about uh, this kind of, let's say, quite, it seems quite esoteric question, but the question basically, um, what, what does open mean? I mean, I even think just recently I've had, uh, I don't know if people here know Josh Torbera, you know, whether, you know, should all open data just be public domain? Um, and obviously also pragmatically, if you're a company using open data, public domain is very attractive because, you know, you know, it's the least obligation of any kind to consume. Um, I think the fundamental point in this debate, so this debate has been, should we allow, does open data even allow people to impose restrictions that say, you can have this data, but if you use it and build on it, you must give back? Or should, you know, open only mean public domain, do whatever you like with it? I think what, the interesting point I would make for OpenStreetMap is I've not seen a community-based project. It kind of seems interesting, but almost every major community, like grassroots data initiative, as, as, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to be wrong by some exception, but most of the most well-known have all used a share alike license. So, FreeDB, which was the mother of all of them, right? It was the it was the it was the fool from Grace, right? I don't know if you know Grace Note. You all use it when you use iTunes, but Grace Note took date. Basically, the big thing was there was this free collected database of you know CD tracks and how they worked, and a company went and took it and kind of closed it and started making money from it and didn't give back. And so a lot of those projects, FreeDB, Wikipedia, OpenStreetMap, you know, have all used a share alike license. And I think so it seems to have been really essential, at least the community, maybe it's just coincidence, it seems to be very essential for those community based projects to have that feeling that people were not going to free ride. Um, I think there comes a point that said, like a lot of Apache projects, which have got a very, you know, software projects, have had a tendency to not be like that and obviously been very, very successful too. Um, I think I think though you know, and I think it's a di it's a really difficult balance. So I, I don't know. I think for OpenStreetMap, obviously it's up to that community, um, and I think the question will be what would be the bringing the greatest. You know, I do think the question of the biggest benefit to that community over time. Um, I personally um, can see the attraction of share alike quite strongly, <laughs> uh, or of attribution quite strongly. At the same time. I, you know, I can see it, its complexities, and we all know, you know, GPL has had its tough, tough times in terms of compatibility. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Uh, one last question. <laughs> so I really liked Jack's question, and kind of pivoting off of it, I was wondering what you thought about. Um, GTFS in terms of 
that as a precedent where like a large vendor would be like a a, a convener of, of a standard that could be adopted into the future um, uh, related to you know the conversation around you know what type of vendors do we get involved with and how do we kind of support and partner right with private vendors like big guys like Google and other folks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, let me say, I think the GTFS has been a kind of unmitigated almost success story. Um, I mean, remember there's also GTFS, which is the format, and then there's it being open. You can have non-open GTFS in theory, right? Um, I think, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think in general, if they can exert pressure to get stuff out, I think the key thing is to also ensure that, it's, that, that it is open. Um, I mean, it's all right. I mean, I don't know if the base question is, do you go and talk with big vendors and if they can exert pressure on, be it municipalities or others, that I think is great if that can happen. And particularly because I think the point of the incentive is, is huge. Like, great, there's all this open data, but if it's actually being integrated in some tool that millions of people use or whatever, that's fantastic. You know, it's really, really great. Um, and so I think, I think, it's, I think it's, it's a good idea. Um, as I said, I think the key thing is to make sure that you're connecting it with the open Part as well. It's not just, hey, here's this format, but it's also, here, here, here it is. Um, Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and, uh, right now, uh, I'm here for, uh, for probably an hour or so. Especially if you're Thank you for joining us. We are very lucky.